Everybody here? Oh, everybody here? All right. I think we're just waiting on Misha to join us and then we'll get started. Hello. Hi. All righty. Thank you everybody for coming. Well, what else are you doing tonight? Let's be honest. <laughs> um, so thank you everybody for tuning in. Um, I'm Lauren Sloan. I'm the initiatives producer for Series Fest. Uh, just wanted to kick off our event tonight by uh, welcoming you to our Creator Hangout. We're focusing on female filmmakers tonight. Um, and if you're not familiar with Series Fest, just to give you a little bit of background, uh, Series Fest is a nonprofit organization. We're dedicated to championing artists at the forefront of episodic storytelling. We're a year-round organization with uh, educational programs, initiatives, supporting underserved voices, and professional development opportunities. Uh, each June, Series Fest culminates in a curated Denver-based festival showcasing um, innovative episodic content in competition, independent pilot screenings, panels, workshops, and live reads, and uh, network television premieres. Uh, so unfortunately this year is a little bit different. So uh, to address the essential needs of the creative community, we're pivoting to a virtual celebration of episodic storytelling this year. Uh, the festival will take place as scheduled from June 18th through 24th and transition to a schedule of virtual events with panels, competitions, and premieres available online. So if you wanna find out more about the festival, please go to seriesfest.com. This event tonight is open to the public uh, with a suggested donation to Series Fest of $10. So if you feel compelled and you're able to do so, you can donate directly through our Facebook or our Instagram. Uh, you can also go to our website at seriesfest.com backslash donate. Uh, and before we get started, just a special thanks to two of our generous year-round partners, Unreal Media and Stevens College MFA. So thank you so much for helping bring great programs like this to our community. Um, and on to tonight's creator hangout, focus on the female filmmakers. Um, so we're going to have a conversation for about 45 minutes or so. Uh, and then for the last 15, we will take your questions from YouTube viewers. So please make sure you put your questions in the YouTube chat channel to the right side of your screen. Um, and introducing our lovely panelists here. Uh, we'll start with Milena Govich. Um, Milena most recently served as a co-executive producer and producing director for Dick Wolf's CBS series, FBI. She's also directed Chicago Fire, multiple episodes of Chicago Med, and the new NBC series in between. Thank you for being here, Milena. Yeah, thanks um, for having me. Thank you. Um, Kate Chamorris is a producer and a director. She, uh, her producing experience includes the short called Blocks that premiered at Sundance's past year and Unspeakable, which uh, Melina actually directed that premiered at South by Southwest in 2018 and also screened at Series Fest in the same year. Thank you, Kate, for being here. Yeah. Uh, I think Rafi Morantz uh, is a writer, director, producer, and actor. Uh, she premiered her autobiographical TV pilot called Rainbow Ruthie at South by Southwest in 2019. And she's currently in development with that project with Big Swing Productions, Kira Sedgwick's company. Thank you for being here, Ruthie. Uh, Misha Calavera is a show creator with projects spanning uh, film, TV, theater, and the digital space. Uh, Misha recently launched a new digital comedy series for Brick TV called All Hail Beth. And I think Misha wins the uh, special guest award for calling in from London tonight. So I hope you like get to sleep in tomorrow. Just nah. maybe take a little after this, just relax. So thank you for joining us. It's an honor to be here. Thank you. Thank you. Last but not least, Rachel Myers. Uh, her film, Wendy Shabbat, premiered at Tribeca Film Festival and the Palm Springs International Film Festival. And Rachel is also the winner of our first Shondaland Women's Directing Mentorship last year. And she got to work on Shondaland Station 19. Uh, and a quick reminder that uh, submissions are now open for round two of the Women's Directing Mentorship with Shondaland. So if you're interested in following Rachel's footsteps, uh, please go check out uh, the program on seriesfest.com. Okay, I'm talking too much. Let's talk about you guys. Um, 
so diving in, I mean, we can kind of address the elephant in the room a little bit. Uh, how's everybody doing at home? Um, and how is it affecting work? How, how are you guys managing being at home and continuing to create great content? Yeah. Kate, I'm looking at you. I, I mean, you can't tell oh, me. Oh, you are looking at me? I'm looking at you. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Like, right. when you're uh, well, after, as, as when this all started, I was just coming off something. So I had said, all right, let your body kind of do its own thing. And I realized I'm a nocturnal person um, <laughs> when I'm not forced to do a 6 a.m. Uh, wake up. But yeah, I had a couple projects that we were hoping to shoot in May, May, June. Uh, so now we're just continuing to prep and have those as ready as possible. Um, you know, pitches are still happening. Catching people who have generally been super busy are now available to have um, chats, which has been kind of a, a plus. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, trying to keep things rolling mm -hmm. as much as possible. Has anybody been pitching virtually doing the Zoom thing? I've been having some um, general meetings, like mm -hmm. with production companies and with studios and this has been a relatively good time for that. Um, they're the oddest general meetings you'll ever have because <laughs> everybody's at home and uh, nobody's dressing up. They're, you're meeting executives in their t-shirts and whatever. Um, but that is similar to what Kate was saying that there, there are some people that have more flexibility to their schedule right now that are willing to um, take a look at projects that are in development or like for me, I'm, I'm really promoting myself as a director for hire. And uh, so this, this has been a relatively good time to make some of those connections. That's great. I guess it kind of takes down that facade where you see, you know, dogs running in the background and you're not really in a boardroom all dressed up. So I yeah. guess it kind of breaks the ice right away. It does. We, we get to know each other very quickly. <laughs> yes, I'm sure. I'm sure. Um, so I guess what um, advice would you guys have for our creators that are tuning in tonight of how that they can utilize this time to make sure that the creative juices are still going and that they're preparing the best they can for when we can come out of our houses? I've been working on a project that's that we've been developing with a virtual team and we've been running a, a virtual writer's room which has been really amazing, a really new experience about how to learn to collaborate through the computer. But it's been really, really actually very fruitful and super creative. And I feel like as artists, we take the experiences around us and we wanna sort of osmose them somehow. And it's been, I mean, for me, it's been like very therapeutic, uh, mm -hmm. keep working, not in a way that feels like the same tempo as, as like normal LA Hollywood life, but like in a way that feels productive and purposeful and um and it's been really empowering and we had a we had a little test shoot for this project last week and it felt like being on set it was like it was like my heart was just totally full even though it's it's a whole new set of circumstances that we're dealing with so so yeah I've been really excited by it that's awesome I mean trying to make hay while the you know sun shines as it were that's true <laughs> I think um, if I may, uh, mental health is paramount and that means mm -hmm. something different to every person. But um, if you don't have your mental health then you're not gonna be able to do really anything. Um, so preserving that for me has been number one. I've been very productive during this time but I have the luxury of being at this time in my career, mostly a writer, show creator. Mm -hmm. So um, you know you don't need anyone to write. You just need your, your mental health really. So um, I've been telling everyone I know, just look out for your yourself and your sanity. And, um, and also this is, uh, this is weird, but try and make yourself, if you can, as an artist, I think make yourself as recession proof as you can, because um, if you're uh, out of, you know, out of a shelter or out of food, you're not gonna be in the mood to be creative. So, um, you know, just get your ducks in a line for whatever you need to, whatever you need to do to try and weather the, uh, the economic stuff that's coming down the, the pipeline. Mm -hmm. that's so too, I, I sort of started in the same way of like, 
uh, bulldozing through work. And it was also just, um, I was trying to write um, and giving myself specific goals of how many pages each day. And like, I was also in New York and uh, it was extremely stressful and hard to be there. And I almost think that was like this sort of manic kind of like, just right through this really awful feeling. And I, I, I sometimes know that as a writer, I work that way, like that I, I feel like I have to be in distress to write, which is a really bad habit I'm trying to break. So I think it's, it just, as long as you give yourself permission to have days where you don't feel good, you know, if you don't and not try to force yourself um, into a position where you're, you're battling the idea that you have to be creative and creating at all moments um, when we're in a really serious situation. It's like, I think just, we're all sort of just adjusting and trying to figure out how we're gonna work um, in these conditions outside of production, just like in all other senses of creating something. And I'll offer too that, uh something that's helped me is to exercise my creativity in something that actually doesn't have to do with my work. Mm -hmm. um, because there's, there's so much wrapped around like what's going to happen and when can we go back and do I even, what's the point of writing something when <laughs> the world is falling apart and people I know are dying. Um, but for me, like playing my piano every day has been an incredible solace or even just doing crafty projects around the house or being in the garden, anything that's active and creative for me has been somewhat more fulfilling than the actual things that might involve a job. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, I find the same, like going for a walk or I've been doing a lot of baking, like, a, and I've never baked before, which is like what it makes, makes it all the crazier, but I feel like it, it like, you know, you're, there's like something tactile about like pounding and kneading bread that all of a sudden I'm like, aha, or it's just a release. So yeah, I, I totally agree with that. That's great. Um, I, yeah, well, first of all, now I know that you're the reason why I can't find flour at the store because all you first time bakers are out there just taking it all. Um, I've, I've seen so many people, you know, coloring books and all, all that sort of thing that, and I, I didn't really think about that before as a, a nice release. So that's a really good point about kind of getting your creativity out through other means. Um, that's wonderful. Um, so I'm, you know, you guys are, you're in the thick of it. You're in the industry. What are you hearing in terms of the temperature of when do you think that we're going to kind of get out of this and how things are going to look? Do you have any kind of, you know, thoughts of of the changing landscape post COVID-19? Oh, there's just so many horror stories floating around about what it could be or when it would be and what it would look like if it is. I mean, uh, who knows? Just who knows? Yeah. I, I have a feeling uh, there's a lot of, I've been hearing rumors of times when certain studios think they want to start coming back. And mm -hmm. I, I would project that some people will go back too soon sure. and people will get sick and We'll have to shut down again <laughs> and I, I yeah i don't know does anybody else have anything i have nothing to say <laughs> netflix was doing like some investigative trials for to roll out production in south overseas and uh maybe finland or something like places that had lower counts they've been looking at that i don't know i don't know what and when but well, I know what they should do, which is an idea that I've been telling anyone who listen, which is a closed studio, quarantine, you go in three, four months at a time, you shoot your feature, you shoot your season one, whatever you need to, no one goes in, no one goes out, you got your food yeah. on the studio lot. I just, I'm really in favor of this. Time will tell. Yeah. Hopefully, hopefully Netflix is listening to me right now. Yeah. What do you think, Kate? Yeah, I had joked like the first week we went into quarantine with another producer. I was like, only way it's going to work is work more on compounds, yep. no one in, no one out. And he was like, yeah. oh, it's never going to happen. But that's actually what people are talking about happening, buying up There's a, box of a lot of uh, hotels. Yeah, hotels and conference centers that are vacant. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. Sounds like yeah, it's going to be only the behind the scenes. <laughs> Yeah. But I mean, it's going to be interesting uh, to see 
I mean, how expensive these testing kits are going to end up being, uh, how we can take what the studios are going to be modeling and transition that into independent productions. Um, that's what, I mean, I'm an indie producer. That's what I'm kind of looking at. I'm like, all right, how are we going to be able to make this scrappy? You can't make people's health scrappy. And right. then you have the super scrappy uh, films that are coming out right now that are very interesting of, you know, home, basically home movies that are being yeah. distributed. Like it's so interesting what's coming out of, you know, people's living rooms right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, not to make a totally bumpy transition to the next topic, but let's move on to things that are a little bit more positive than COVID-19. But um, I would love to kind of, we have such a great um, set of filmmakers in front of me. So I'd want to get your thoughts on, you know, the creators that are tuning in and they want to kickstart their career. Or they're just trying to get in. Um, what do you think are just like the, the practical tips for an emerging female filmmaker? Um, what would you say to your younger self? Did when you were starting out, how, how about that? I mean, Melena, you've had such a successful career in the network TV space. I would love to hear what you would tell your younger self about how to break into the industry. Yeah, um, huh, I'd have a lot to say to myself. <laughs> um, I think one thing, the, the one thing that um, young filmmakers, creators, performers can really benefit from is to have an idea of where you wanna go. Mm -hmm. um, to have a specific idea of where you might want to land in your career and then kind of reverse engineer as much as you can your portfolio that can get you to that place. It's something I, um, I started my career as an actor for many, many years and um, it's kind of a similar conversation you would have with an actor to say, know your type, you know. Are you the girl next door? Are you the, the bombshell? Are you the femme fatale? Like what, what is your type? And you should know that as a content creator and as a filmmaker as well. So um, to use myself as an example, I wanted to become a television director after I had had this very long acting career. So I, uh, I looked at shows that were on the air that I thought would be a good fit for me. Not only a good fit for me and my personality and my taste, but also places where I think I could get hired, you know, that it would be reciprocal. So um, the two short films that I went out and made are both very targeted for those markets. The first short film I made is a dark comedy because I love things like Better Call Saul and Killing Eve and um, so one hour dark comedy is character driven. So that's a kind of short I made. The other short I made is a proof of concept for a TV show, Unspeakable, which we mentioned. Um, and Unspeakable I made because I thought I, I want a sample of where I could get hired on FX or you know HBO, these or the darker side of the streamers. So it's a drama, it's a thriller. Um, there's a, a lot of darker shots and more interesting angles. So I've, I've created my sample so that when I come forward and start asking people to say, hey, will you take a look at my work? I know you're the showrunner on whatever, on Fargo, on FX. Um, and they go, yeah, yeah, I'll have a conversation with you and look at your materials. When that little door cracks open, you have something to kick it the rest of the way in. Mm -hmm. Um, so, so that's a general thing. And that, that's in regard to um, things that you've shot, things that you're writing, um, if you're performing, you know, things, the roles that really show you in that light. Because what you, what you don't want is to get the opportunity to come, to, to come in front of you and then you can't really take advantage of it. Mm -hmm. So this is actually a great time to get your portfolio together, to get your website together, to go take your own headshots in the backyard <laughs> if you have to. Um, but to really think in those terms of like, what do I have? What have I made? Where do I wanna go? And then how can I position my materials to really set me up for success? I think that's great advice to kind of have that wherewithal because it's hard when you have, you're, you're, you feel like you're a creator and you just want to create and you aren't just grabbing the first thing that comes to you, but to really go in methodically about where your strengths yeah. lie and, and where or you want to grab that information, inspiration and say, okay, this is what I'm inspired to do. This is what appeals mm -hmm. to me. 
who's distributing this kind of work? Right. You know, is it Netflix? Is it Amazon? You know, is it Freeform? Yep. Look at that, their marketplace, their tastes, and you'll find where your, your own taste tends to lie. Mm -hmm. Um, Ruthie, I would be remiss if I didn't ask what you would say to your younger self, because <laughs> you've seen your younger self on camera on public access. So you can, Rainbow Ruthie is your autobiographical TV pilot when you actually filmed yourself and you were on public access in New York. So, I mean, were, did you always want to be a filmmaker or would you like to go yell at that girl? on the public access show and, and tell her something else. No, I actually, yeah, I kind of knew that that's what I wanted to do um, mm -hmm. from a really young age. And I, you know, when I was doing my show, I didn't really know what I was doing at all. I was just kind of, I mean, I was 13, I was going through the motions, but um, if I look back on it now, I'm like, oh, that was the first sort of time that I, I was trying to make, I was trying to be a filmmaker. I had two VCRs and a, high eight camera and a tripod and um you know literally no editing software nothing and I just sort of like had to slap together a 28 minute show twice a month um so yeah I mean I think the hardest that came really easy so um it felt effortless at the time even though it's it's crazy to think about it now I think the hardest time for me was like in between like the whole gap of time in between college and then sort of after college of like sort of being like what is a filmmaker like how do I do this like everyone in New York works 16 jobs like no one wants to shoot a music video with me you know like how do I what is this like how do I get in and for me it was the best decision I made was to apply to a grad graduate program and I went um, through the MFA program at NYU because that's, I was sort of lacking the community. Um, I had ideas and I had um, things that I was thinking about, storyboarding stuff, just kind of like, I don't know, all the stuff I could do by myself, but I didn't have the access to a community. I didn't have the access to equipment, any of that. And it's, there's not one way to do it. Um, for me, it really helped, uh, find sort of like a tribe of people that I know I, I can always call and work with. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I think like my thing would be um, just, you know, it's really hard. <laughs> this is a very, really extremely hard profession. And there's been many times where I'm like, why am I doing this? Like, this is so freaking hard. But if you just kind of keep funneling through it and you keep pushing yourself forward eventually you get there and you start to like hone in on your voice and hone in on the particular tracks you want to do like whether it's be a cinematographer or an editor or a writer and you start to really define like what your voice is within that but it takes time like I would just tell myself to not put too much pressure on like being you know you always read those stories of like 21 year old filmmakers that, you know, sold their shit at Sundance or whatever, but like, you don't have to do that. Like you can take a different path and um, just like be patient with the whole process because it, it's not for something to get made as I'm sure everyone knows, it's just like a miracle. Anytime anything is like finished, you're like, hallelujah. Um, because, you know, it, it takes so many people and so much time and effort to just finish a project. So just be patient and keep going. Great. <laughs> Anybody else want to talk to their younger self? Um, well, I had like a long way around into being like behind the camera as a director and creator of material. My path was as a designer and I worked as a production designer for almost 20 years. Um, and so what I would say to myself, because I directed in college and then I basically got scared and picked a lane of something I was really good at. And I was able to like sit back seat and watch the process on Disney and Netflix movies and all these cool things that I've worked on. But the thing that I learned was 
that I didn't need permission. And it's like taken me, I'm going to be 40 this weekend. <laughs> and it's taken me like, okay. thank you. And it's taken me um, like many years, like in the last few years to realize that, that, that you are going to be the only one to champion your voice. And that if you have something to say, like we've all put in our 10,000 hours and like, just go make it. You know, if you have good taste and you believe in it and you have a community of artists to bounce it off of and like work on it, like just do it. Um, because my first film that did really well was like something I just like did on a weekend and called in favors and like I put like this much of my energy into it and then when it did well it was like this amazing surprise and then I thought oh wait what if I actually gave my full attention the way that I have to this other part of the career in the industry to the thing that I wanted to do so like that's been my journey in the last few years and and I'm really inspired by the other women on this panel and like by other women filmmakers in particular, because I feel like when I was coming up, there weren't very many women to look, look to as mentors um, of people who were doing it. And now you look and you're like, oh, there's, you know, there's Chloe Zhao. And there's like, like you look at the list of the independent spirit nominated directors and you're like, oh, the tide is kind of changing. But, but I felt like when you don't see yourself represented, it's hard to imagine it for yourself if no one ever told you that you could. So, Absolutely. so I would say just go do things. <laughs> I'm gonna awesome. second that real quick and just say that you, you'll find that people will jump on a moving train. Mm -hmm. if, if you get going and you just don't, like you said, Rachel, don't ask for permission, just say, I'm doing this. Are you coming or not? My train is leaving. Yes. Are you on it or not? And you'll find you'll find support in surprising places. That's a great way to put it. Yeah, and I think to that point, Rachel, too, of self-trust, um, putting on those blinders of what everyone else is doing, what's working for everyone else. How did that person get there? Maybe I'll do those exact steps to get there. Everyone is on their own sort of, you know, journey mm -hmm. and listening to that little voice that's inside of you when you're at that crossroads, really hooking into what's exciting me. Cause that's what's, you need that excitement to really fuel what you're doing. Mm -hmm. And I think listening, finding the intuition and listening to that voice. Yeah. Cause there's been times where I'm like, no, that's, that's not, I shouldn't do that. Mm -hmm. But it really was the right thing. And just as you get older, you learn and learn to listen to that little intuition, I think. That's really Great. smart. It's so hard to hear that voice. Well, speaking of your voice, I want to talk about just kind of the collection. You, the, you guys all together all have female protagonists in the projects that, that you've, you're a body of work that I've seen. Um, and I want to talk about just like the female voice, what you were just saying about being represented on screen. And when you're seeing a female director or a female writer, kind of that female gaze kind of coming through, do you think that that shows in your work or is that something that just kind of naturally happens? Um, I know Misha, I mean, all hail Beth, you have a female protagonist throughout your whole digital series. I mean, did you kind of mold her? I mean, just as a character or as a female character? Ooh, tricky question there um multi-layered i will uh i will say that um humans are humans and it's best to approach a character like a human yeah um and i guess it's kind of shocking still that there's so much content out there with uh, unbelievable female characters or shows that are about women written by men um yeah uh as far as all hail beth Mm -hmm. uh, I am a female and I can write authentically about a female experience more authentically than a male experience. So I think, um, you know, for projects that are about women uh, really at, at their, with, with female protagonists or female ensemble cast that, um, that we should let women write those pieces. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Melina, you were saying earlier, um, in a conversation we had yesterday about when you're given material that you don't think properly uh, reflects the female character that you kind of 
manipulate it in a way as a director that kind of does the character more justice than what's on the page, right? Oh, I'm very manipulative. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, no, but truth, truthfully, um, there are a lot of tools at our disposal as filmmakers, even if we're collaborating with other people. And, you know, I, I try not to pass judgment on any of the material that I'm working on, whether it's my own writing or other writers work. But I do think I have a tremendous responsibility to mine everything in that material for what it's worth mm -hmm. and to make sure that the points of view for all the characters are really strong and sharp because that's how you get the best storytelling and the best scene work and the best performances. I do find just for the nature of the business and who is writing a lot of the stuff that sometimes if there hasn't been a strong female voice in the development process of something, I will sometimes get material and go, you know what? I I think I'll, I'll, I'll broach it with the writers. I won't ever come out and say that, oh, you don't know how to write women because that's not the case. No, nobody is trying to do a bad job ever, right? Everybody's trying to be as authentic as they can. But sometimes there's just things someone who is coming from a different life experience, they're not gonna think of. And so that, mm -hmm. that's really what, where I find that wiggle room is by asking questions and so, well, I, how, how have you thought of it like this? Or why did you choose to do it that way? And it opens up a conversation. Because mm -hmm. really that's all I'm trying to do is have a conversation with my collaborators. Mm -hmm. find, find their intention for the moment, for the story, for the character. And then I'm on the same page with them. And then we move forward together and figure out how we might massage it. Um, and there are tools at my disposal as a director and as a producer, even if I'm not the writer creator, to stage the scene in a certain way or use the camera movement in a certain way to make sure that all the characters are, are elucidated to the audience, that we understand why they're doing what they're doing, what they want and what's getting in their way at all times, the mm -hmm. best we can. And I, I do find I have the most to offer in that arena, uh, often when it's the female character and, because I'm attentive to that and it's important to me. So, um, so yeah, there's, there's, there's things that we can do in every phase that can just make sure we're being as authentic to the characters as we can. That's great. Well said. Um, Kate, and I, the, the project that I saw of yours that I am just gonna keep praising blocks um, from Sundance this past year had a, a mother female protagonist. Um, and I, uh, I have two young kids myself. I'm currently surrounded by Legos. You're not gonna see them, but they're here. Um, and I just, I just identified with that character so much that I could just tell that I felt like that I, you could tell it was created by female filmmakers. I don't know how else to put it. Um, do you think that that just resonated through? Was that intentional or just kind of how it naturally progressed? Well, I think the intention is there in Bridget Maloney, who's the writer, director, uh, the intention to be authentic to her experience. And when I'm looking for projects as a producer, it's, it's trying to find a universal truth, mm. but told through such a specific lens, like super, super specific. Mm -hmm. And I just found that Bridget's way of showing potentially a mundane thing of picking up a, a poopy wipe off the ground uh, and making that funny and relatable. And when your audience is watching it, they feel like they're not alone. Mm -hmm. I mean, that movie doesn't touch only women. It touches fathers, it's parents in general. And the reason it touches everyone is because it's so authentic mm -hmm. to Bridget. And it just so happens it's told from the mother's point of view. Um, but I mean, her husband is a writer director as well, and he has something that is told from the father's point of view, and it's equally as, uh, you know, universal. And I think when you hook into that universal truth of that character, um, the authenticity of it, yeah, human. That's great. Um, 
Rachel, I want to circle back to something that you said earlier about the importance of mentorship and, and training. Um, I, could you speak a little bit to your experience with the Shondaland mentorship and, and how, you know, being surrounded by such a powerhouse of female creators really um, impacted your, your, your career path? Yeah, I mean, there's been like, I can basically chart like in my coming up and as a director transitioning from design, like the, the female producers and um, directors and executives who basically like pulled me and were like, girl, like you're coming with me. Like I'm opening a door for you. And like, and there's like, like I can think of, of you know, the last 10 years, I'm like, okay, there's, there, there are all of these folks. And the Shondaland experience was part of that chapter. And so now I can add like Tessa Blake and Allison Eagle and, and like the folks at Shondaland who, who brokered the, the deal with Series Fest because when you're on set and you know, I'm, and because I've been designing for so long, you know, as a production designer, you're like, you're in the tech van with the director, you're hearing all the calls, you're basically like director shadowing all the time. So it's been interesting transitioning into episodic director shadowing. I, I shadowed Tessa, which was great at Station 19, like from the get-go, from seeing prep through production um, and and the edit and just seeing the like the way that the 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 daily operations are are maneuvered. And like also I think there is a, a thing and 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 maybe like Melina could speak to this because you have more television directing experience. But I always find from the sets that I've been on like there's a different climate every time um, and there's a different you just you never know who the the players are and how things are going to happen and and I've director shouted a couple on a couple different series in addition to the series that I've worked on and so and so that was that's also like an interesting part of the equation because like coming in as an episodic director you just never know like you know I I know now like oh awesome this is what station 19 is like I was on SEAL team I was on um Lucifer and I know what those shows are like but but you have no, you know, you have to, you, you're sort of like visiting and you have to sort of assess the scene. And, and I think also there's another level of that of being a woman visitor and like coming in and, and, and stepping into a leadership role. So yeah, it was really great. I mean, to be able to watch master, master crafts people make the work and a super seasoned crew who operates you know, they anticipate even before the director sometimes would say, you could see her kind of look and like, because the camera operators have been there for 30 years. So like they're a well-oiled machine um, and seeing that mechanism was really awesome. Great. Does anyone else feel like that they um, benefited from a mentor coming up in the industry? Oh, I did big time. Really? Yeah, many, many mentors. I have, I have many people that I, I can call on that have supported me at various phases. Um, I wouldn't say I have a singular mentor. That's somebody that I'm always checking in with, mm -hmm. but at various phases throughout, um, I've, I've cultivated relationships. And I, so I have many people that I can go to and um, Rachel's absolutely right. My experience is the same as what you mentioned, which is every set is different. Uh, every environment is different. Every collaboration is different. Mm -hmm. And even if one person had one experience on a set, I'm a different person. So I'm gonna come in and I'm gonna have my own unique experience on this set. So in that regard, there's absolutely no way to know what's gonna happen. <laughs> um, but if you have a roster of people that are open to communication with you, that have a certain uh, set of experiences, I can say, well, I'm about to go on, you know, to this like, really soapy drama drama. So I'm gonna call Norman Buckley who directed a million episodes of Pretty Little Liars, right? And I'm gonna say, can, can I talk to you about what I'm about to embark on here? So mm -hmm. the, there's, um, there's benefit to having as many people as you can. And, uh, and I find those mentors come from all different places. You never know when you're gonna cross paths with someone that you're gonna mm -hmm. click with and that you'll be able mm -hmm. to um, lean on in the future. Is that what you would suggest for somebody trying to break into industry, just kind of find a mentor and, and you know, how, what's the best way to click with a mentor? That's tough. I mean, I honestly, I think the programs um, that are out there are great. Like mm -hmm. I was in the, um, the AFI directing workshop for women 
which is mm-hmm. a phenomenal life-changing experience for me. And mm-hmm. I, I found many supportive people through that. Um, so it, mentors will come back, come to you organically in a lot of ways. Mm-hmm. So uh, I would say if you're looking for mentorship, just start getting involved in things. Get involved in things like Serious Fest. I, I'm, when I was there, uh, Kate and I were there with Unspeakable um, two years ago, we met fantastic people. And there's people that I'm still in touch with that I met at Series Fest. So get involved, to, um, go to festivals, watch television so you're up to date on what's being made and how. Mm-hmm. And there are, there's, um, there's communities as well mm-hmm. online and there's tons of stuff online now. I mean, th- this is actually a great time if you are kind of feeling like you're on the outside and you don't have any ins. There's, there's things like this that are happening that are free or like small donation and you guys mm-hmm. can donate. It's up, it's good. <laughs> um, but there's just a lot of opportunities online for access for things like this and um, show up, be enthusiastic um, be, uh, be involved, but don't overdo it because <laughs> you can't come in desperate and be like, I need your help. I'm like, like wow, who are you? I don't, ooh, this is kind of a weirdo. I don't know. <laughs> you know, just pr- approach someone like you would a new friend mm-hmm. would be the best way to go about it. I think that's good tip. Misha, Ruthie, would you agree with that? Any t- tips for people trying to break in? Um, yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, I mean, I've only been at this, um, just over four years, so, um, haven't gone through any, you have a series and you've only been doing it for four years. I have four series. Okay. That's amazing. Okay. That's great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, the first one, actually I do have a mentor who I got a shout out right now, Kimberly Browning, who's, uh, one of the EPs of the HBO access program. Um, but I haven't done that program, but she's, she's a phenomenal filmmaker herself. And she was um, the first person to, uh, to kind of help me um, understand that I could even possibly be in the industry, which I don't, I, I don't know if anyone else feels this. I don't think I'm in the industry and I don't think I've like done anything like great or special. And um, so if anyone else feels that way, who's listening, uh, you're not alone, but um I think if you are like that and you're like, oh, I, I just could never like make it, but I'm gonna keep making my things anyway, a mentor is critical to help you pivot those negative self-beliefs to believing that you might actually have a shot. And to mm-hmm. when, when you are in a moment of self-doubt, that mentor, just even having one person can help you stay in it for like one day longer. And that one day might, make the difference between, you know, do, do or don't. I didn't have mentors for a very long time. Once again, going with my theme of everything taking a very long time. Um, and it, it just, it came through, um, the program at my school. I ended up identifying like a couple professors that invested in me, in my career, like, uh, Spike Lee, who was, um, our directing teacher at NYU, like, uh, ended up giving me money to make Rainbow Ruthie. Um, and that was like, you know, a huge thing of combination of luck and hard work that, that ended up that way. But I would say, um, in the period of time before you can have access to some of these like more elite spaces is, sometimes it's good to have a mentor that's not in the film industry, um, like a novelist or a writer or someone that you can show your screenplay to, or even just a friend whose like opinion you trust on, um, you watch the same stuff, you love the same stuff, like have them read your script, have them look at your pitch deck, befriend a graphic designer to help you make a pitch deck, like all these little things that are kind of, you know, it's, it, it works, I've found in the industry that like once one door opens, a lot of other doors open. And the hardest thing is getting that first like break and that first little in. Um, so, and that can last a long time. So that, that period of time, you know, I really think just find a couple people that you really trust showing your work to, whether it's a short, whether it's a script, like, you know, they're gonna tell you exactly how they feel. They're not gonna sugarcoat it. And, um, yeah, identify where those people are, 
keep them close to you because you'll probably end up using their opinion for like the rest of your career if you can identify who that is that you would trust you know that's great i think everybody should have a graphic designer friend that's <laughs> very valuable i mean i need i need an editor friend because i'm terrible at it and a graphic designer friend and that it will take you far that's uh, great. one other thing i would also add is that like the first people who opened the door for me said to me, like, there's one producer, Effie Brown, who, who opened the door and she was like, look, like, we have to hire other women and we have to hire people of color. And, and like, she said that to me, like, very early on in my career. And that has, like, shaped my hiring practices when I've been in the position to open the door for other people. And, and I think that that's part of the responsibility of, like, as you come up as a woman in the business is, like, to help cultivate the environment make to, to do the thing that was done for you and like help train and apprentice and mentor and like offer opportunities for people who who like may not have the door open for them otherwise great great well uh i think we're gonna go over to our youtube questions um and see what everybody is asking us and if you have yet to send in your question please do um well, so Julia Hess asked, uh, what is a great entry level job that will help someone better prepare themselves to move in the direction of directing? So directors, um, does everybody start as a PA or can you uh, finagle your way to start at a different spot if you go to be a director faster? Uh, well, much like what Rachel said that everybody has a different path. I think Kate said that as well. Like mm -hmm. people come to the higher positions from all walks. I, I would say just get on set however you can get on set. Whatever your interest is, if you just wanna start as a PA, great, start as a PA, you'll get a scope of what all the possibilities are. And then once you do get in the door, make it known what you're interested in. I'm gonna repeat myself in that it's really important to have goals and to know where you wanna be because the people know how to help you. Mm -hmm. They can steer you in the right direction. Mm -hmm. um, I also suggest doing background work because it's it's quite simple to get some ex so set experience. I can't vouch for what kind of set experience you'll get, but um, sign up to be an extra and just get a vibe of what's going on. And it's kind of a nice way to peek behind the curtain of production without mm -hmm. really having any responsibility at all. <laughs> That's great. Was that, how was the transition for you from being an actor to directing? Well, um, I made a very specific and deliberate pivot towards directing. Um, I knew that I needed to really demonstrate my ability so that when I do make these asks of people that I'm not just saying, oh, well, can, can I direct an episode? And they say, well, what have you directed? Oh, nothing, but I should direct. No, <laughs> that's not how this works. Um, so I, I had given 20 years to an acting career. I figured I could give a, my full attention for a few years to directing exclusively. Mm -hmm. I fell in love with it and I have not gone back to acting. <laughs> I still act when people ask me to, but I haven't been auditioning in many years. Um, I still try to do at least like one feature a year to just keep my low levels of terror <laughs> up. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, no, I, I made a very deliberate choice. And then I went to AFI and, you know, the directing workshop for women is in, in total about a year and a half long and it's very mm -hmm. intensive. And mm -hmm. so I, I trained and then I came back about two years. That was, that was about two years where I didn't work. Mm -hmm. um, and put all my focus on training and getting work samples. And at that point, then I started approaching everyone I ever knew in the business, <laughs> asking them to look at my materials, to watch my shorts, to take a coffee, or to even just talk on the phone and start making my asks. That's great. Um, well, Brent and Tyner, Brian from YouTube wants to know how you guys got hired for your first, for your first first directing opportunity. Um, did you just make it or did you actually go out and get hired? I mean, it sounds like everybody's got a bit of a combo. 
Ruthie? It's so great to be, oh, I'm not Ruthie, but oh, no, uh, no, go, uh, uh, you go after me, Ruthie. Um, it's so great to be an executive producer. And um, I just advocate for that, uh, for women, whenever you can negotiate to be an executive producer on your own work, because you just have so much more power, delicious power <laughs> to hire yourself and hire whoever you want. It's great. Um, so the first few shows that, the first three that I did, I was um, the creator and executive producer mm -hmm. and uh, directed two of them. Uh, T Textual Intercourse, which is not available yet online. Strut, which is, uh, I didn't direct, but, um, Step into my office, if you want to see it, is really good and it's free and it's online. But um, the fourth show, so by then I had kind of had a portfolio, Milena, as you're saying, and um, I was at the Creators Market at Tribeca and I met with a small New York network called Brick TV. And then they gave me some money to again, hire myself, but still it's all about building the portfolio. And then I think creating opportunities for yourself so that you can be, um, you know, not only, as I said before, recession proof and continue making no matter what, but um, uh, to be able to continue, um, I lost track of what I'm saying. So Ruthie, it's all you. Make your opportunities, Ruthie. I would just say, I mean, same, hire yourself. Like if you can't wait for someone to hire you as director, you just hire yourself immediately. I did it when I was 13 anyone can do it like make your own stuff start doing it immediately um there's going to be a lot of uh, mistakes that you're going to make that you're going to erase a couple films i'm sure drive's going to crash computer's going to like something it's all going to happen you just have to go through it and yeah i mean directing jobs are few and far between like let's be real it's not like you're going to get paid to direct right at the beginning. So just um, direct your own stuff. Maybe you don't want to write at all. Someone has a script um, in a program that you connect with and just ask them, hey, can I direct this short? I'm a first time director, but I'd lo I love your script and make sure you actually love it. And, you know, try and get it made. It's, it's not easy to do. Um, you might have to fundraise. You might have to um, ask for favors for from people for a couple of years, but there is a way to make direct your own work, even without um, you being a name. And that's actually the best skill that you can have. Like long-term, you need to know what it takes to actually execute an idea from the page. So it's, it's the best practice is just, by investing in yourself, investing in your ideas, and you know, finding other people whose work really excites you. Um, That's great. I, I would also add though, um, that like, that coming up through production, the production route, like really like, like it opened doors for Milena, like it, it, it led to my first directing job, having had a career and having established myself and, and through relationships and then being able to circle back to those relationships was really empowering. So, you know, most jobs these days, I feel like come from like meeting somebody at a birthday party or having a conversation, but lo people love talking about themselves. And so, and so I would say like anybody, you know, in your network that you think is interesting, like people would lo love to have mentorship coffees with people, even now, like Zooms, they're home. Um, yeah. And so, <laughs> and so I think just, you know, it, it, it is, I think there's a great skill to also be learned to, to like, depending where you want to end up in the industry, to see the machine of production, because all of the crafts that make, make movies and TV possible at a big scale, like when I see a PA like changing trash cans regularly, or somebody who's driving the shuttle of the truck and they're smart and they're asking questions, like, like I've in many cases seen that same person like pop up and they're in a much higher position on the next role so I would just say like doesn't matter if you're helping with crafty like bring your a-game and ask questions and like it will come back to you great uh, I want to take another question from YouTube and Kate I think this would be a good one for you if you don't mind feeling sure. this one um, Sean Quinn asked how do you turn a good idea for a story into an outline um, or how do you into an outline and then how do you turn that into a good script so pretty much how do you go from 
this is a good idea. That should be a script. What do you think that the development process should be? It's kind of personal, especially if that person is writing it. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I think there's, there's more than two ways to do this, but I think it's asking yourself as like, if I have a writer who's stuck, um, I kind of ask, I ask them to think about what their thesis is. What is that initial thing that really excites them? Mm -hmm. And if it's more of a character that's exciting them, then I tell them to like journal as the character, really do a lot of character work, like almost as if you were an actor and building out that character's world. Um, or you're just gonna outline it like, you just outline it. Yeah. I don't know, I'm a little confused at the question. <laughs> how do you, how do you know that? Honest. I feel like everyone's like, oh, my life is just so interesting right now. This should be a script and turn it into an idea. So, but I think that that's, that's smart though, to outline it and kind of think about the character development and not just, people clearly want to see me eating Cheetos on the couch. Yeah, There's I mean, everything really has to, everything has to answer something else. Like yep. an action isn't going to happen if it wasn't inspired by what just happened. So think about those big moments that you want to explore, those big moments that excite you. Yeah. Um, and then you can outline around that. That's great. Um, maybe Misha, I don't know if you were going to about to say something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, just because I've just re basically rewritten um, from scratch of 50 page pilot in five days. So this topic is on my mind. Um, it's tough if you, especially the longer the project, the harder it is to crank out a script, right? But there's a lot of classes that are really yeah. good. And, you know, a lot of bad ones, find the good ones, ask around. And if you're just starting out as a writer, get in some classes because of course, um, as you're saying, the, the inspiration is critical to having the willpower to get through your fourth, fifth, sixth draft but also the craft is something you can absolutely learn. Craft is so different from talent. And there's so many great classes, take classes I did, and I learned how to craft a screenplay and I couldn't have done it without that. Great, great. Also, it depends on your style, like of writing. Some people I know, you know, they will um, not outline and just start like busting out scenes, busting out pages, and I'm like, well, you know, like it, it totally, you're going to have to figure out how you can finish a script, you know, because I find like, unless I have some sort of outline, I can start just writing, but at some point I'm going to stop. Like at some point I get stuck and I'm like, I don't wait, what was the character doing on this page? And who is, when did we meet him? Like, so I use cards, like index cards, do the beats, put them on my wall whatever it is it, you, there's like specific styles but it's really like however you get to finish your script um mm -hmm. some people never use an outline some people outline every single moment so mm -hmm. you're gonna learn just the more you practice it absolutely yeah and it depends what you're writing too yeah it's, yeah so the classes and finding your process is all mm -hmm. important. absolutely um Ruthie, I have a question for you specifically from our friend Tina R. Uh, she asked, the trailer for Rainbow Ruthie looks amazing. Where can we watch it? How's that? Go? So you're in development, right? Yeah. Um, you, I, you can't watch it yet, but uh, hopefully really soon. Yeah, we're, we're trying to, um, I have it in development right now and we're sort of reconfiguring the whole show and looking to sell the streaming um, platform, but we're sort of been a little delayed with the with the pitching schedules, everything sort of flying up in the air. Um, yeah. So hopefully really soon I'll have the old pilot online, um, but there's a new show in the works sort of based on that trailer. So just hang tight. Great. Um, I want to ask one last question um, from Rob on YouTube. What advice do you have for a first time writer who has just wrote and produced their first series, which is currently being accepted into major TV festivals? Um, and how do you make the most of the experience? Get a pitch deck. Mm -hmm. And um, let everyone know that you're in these festivals. Um, never underestimate the cold outreach 
Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't have an agent or a manager and I've met with a lot of networks just from wow. giving myself permission to contact in the right way. So <laughs> figure out, figure out what that right way is. And then, um, just be, you know, be friendly and cordial and, and, uh, uh gregarious and mm-hmm. tell people about it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the like advice for festival, like series fest, it's like, everyone's right there. It's like a couple places that you all go. Um, mm-hmm. And it's, it's like, it feels very easy to just approach people. Um, and I'm someone that really struggles with that. And I've had to get better at it. Um, just doing festival runs and like pushing myself to be more outgoing. Um, but it's, you know, depending on the festival, sometimes it's like you're, you're in these same four spaces together. So just don't be scared to introduce yourself, have a business card, have, you know, a way for someone to contact you and um, practice networking. You're gonna need to do that. (laughs) For the rest of your life. Also have a couple other ideas in your back pocket. It um, helps you stay sane too. So you don't just have one thing that you're uber focusing Mm -hmm. um, on because sometimes things will get traction and then they'll need a little breather and you'll have to go on to something else before you can loop back to that thing that had traction in the beginning. Um, that's oh. great. Yeah. That's great. Well, I think we've reached the end of our time. I want to talk to you guys more, but we've run out of time. Um, if there's any final thoughts, I feel like Jerry Springer with final thoughts, but, um, I I'm just so happy you guys were able to join us tonight and I hope everybody benefited from this great conversation. And, uh, I'm very impressed with all of you guys and all of your work. And I'm just uh, thankful that you're part of the Series Fest community. Thank you. Thank you. This was a lot of and, fun. And how do people find Series Fest when it's time to like, like attend it this year? Seriesfest.com. Um, yes. yeah, everyone, please do check out Seriesfest.com. We'll have more information about how the virtual fest is coming up. Um, and uh, we just want you to stay in touch and follow us on social media and uh, we have more creator hangouts next week and more watch parties leading up to the virtual festival so um, don't forget to donate to uh, seriesfest.com backslash donate thank you guys so much for joining us and uh, we'll see you soon Bye. bye thank you so much everyone